behavioral finance. A topic which is certainly becoming more and more important, especially after the financial crisis of 2008, we became more aware of how psychology and finance play together. Uh, we thought as an economic association to emphasize these two the sciences together. So those two very special guest speakers in our faculty, and we're very proud to have both of them here at uh, Bukon University. Professor Nicola uh, Genaioli will initiate the session with an introduction into the basic frameworks and uh, the themes of behavioral finance. A few words on Professor Genaioli. He published many papers leading to national uh, journals. Uh, he obtained his PhD in economics from uh, Harvard University. He was then in many leading uh, worldwide institutions, maybe I'll name some notable. The uh, Stockholm University, the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics, and obviously other research centers all around the world. So without taking away too much, I will leave now the floor to Professor Jenei Orly, and I really hope you enjoy the introductionary part into behavioral finance. All right. Uh, thanks for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. And we have a very developed theoretical mainstream finance that has been challenged by the task prediction and it has been challenged by empirical work that we don't yet have a theory, a coherent, consistent theory, a consistent and coherent model of behavioral finance, which is to say departures from the standard finance models that are psychologically justified. What I'm going to talk, therefore, today about is a bit of background first on traditional finance, and in particular, on the proposition that uh, encapsulates it, which is the efficient market hypothesis. I will discuss a bit the history of economic thought of that, how the efficient market hypothesis was initially tested and was initially confirmed in the data, but then how the consensus around the efficient market hypothesis crumbled as this confirming evidence was presented. Towards the end, I am going to characterize what are uh, some of the themes behind explanations that uh, financial economists give to uh, anomalies. Uh, and these themes are psychological. And while these do not yet provide a coherent framework, they uh, put forth the challenges uh, that uh, we need to take up and issues that we try to understand. So I will try to also uh, give a view on those challenges. So what is uh, the standard definition of an efficient market? Of a market in which there are no behavioral problems, uh, so to speak. The textbook definition of an efficient market is of a market in which every single security gets a fair price. And what is the fair price? Is the present discounted value of the securities payoff computed using optimal expectations. And the idea of expectations is central. A security delivers payment in the future. To correctly price it, you need to have correct expectations about it. And uh, what are correct expectations are those that optimally use all the information available uh, both in the public and also to market participants. What is the argument behind market efficiency? Do we think that every single market participant is able to form statistically optimal expectations in light of the available data? Of course not. It's not that uh, people who put forth the efficient market hypothesis 
were so naive into thinking that we are all fully sophisticated statisticians. But there is an argument, uh, a conceptually cogent argument, uh, which even in a world in which only a few people are perfect statistical machines should ensure that prices move towards their views and not the views of the imperfect informational processors. And the idea is the idea of arbitrage. If, for some reason, <coughs> prices, because of irrational forces, deviate from what correct expectations would dictate, then those holding correct expectations could make an arbitrage. They could engineer a trading strategy that is going to make them profit and is going to make those holding incorrect expectations lose. Arbitrage is the simultaneous purchase and sale of the same or essentially similar securities in two different markets for advantageously different prices. Okay? So you have essentially the same security which is sold in a market at $3 and sold in another market at $2. You buy it at 2, you sell it at 3, you keep 1 for every unit you sell. Uh, what's this definition I'm covering? The basic idea of arbitrage that gives a certain profit. It requires no capital and it entails no risk. So the idea is if there is a deviation of prices from those implied by optimal forecasts, those capable of doing the optimal forecasts could set up a trading strategy that would allow them to gain at the expense of people holding incorrect forecasts. And so you could have a Darwinian world where bad information processing people would lose at the expense of people with better information processing capacities. So that in the end the prices should, should move towards the views of the land. Now, when it comes to testing empirically these propositions, uh, the beauty of the efficient market hypothesis is that it does quite striking predictions of what we should see in the data. And what I'm going to talk about is two main versions. There are in fact three versions of market efficiency, but one is more stringent and subtle than the others. I will talk about the two main versions of uh, the efficient market hypothesis and of two empirical tests that follow directly from these versions. Uh, version number one. Uh, a financial market is efficient when stock returns cannot be predicted using past stock returns. So I've tried to make a forecast of what a return on a stock investment will be tomorrow. I cannot base that forecast on the return that I saw yesterday because there is no information I contact. And in particular, uh, there is no information I contend in any information that was held in the past about the GDP, about whatever, the state of the economy that can help me predict returns in the future. This is called the random walk hypothesis because it's telling you that returns kind of randomly fluctuate. They are unpredictable. One way in which initially uh, this proposition was confronted, was tested in the data, is to simply correlate returns at time t with returns at time t plus 1. So take a stock, compute the return of the stock that you experienced today relative to purchasing, say, the stock yesterday, and then correlate it with the return on the same stock that you will obtain Tomorrow, if you buy it today. Now, 
if you do this test, often you find that there is indeed an correlation. Particularly, particularly if you look at high frequencies. So this was one of the most persuasive tests done initially. So this scatter plot presents you uh, returns on a certain day vis-a-vis -vis returns next day. So very high frequency, one day to the other. You see? This is an amazing lack of correlation. So that was viewed as a strong evidence in favor of the efficient market hypothesis. The second version of the efficient market hypothesis is that uh, stock returns cannot be predicted from any public information, not just returns. And this is called semi-strong form of market efficiency. And what the implication of this uh, form is, is that whenever news arrives, uh, stock prices should immediately adjust to the news so that future stock returns will not be affected by the news. One uh, test that people uh, did with respect to uh, this proposition was called event study analysis. What is event studies analysis? There is a certain event occurring at a certain point of, in time, say release of information, and then study whether the prices of a certain stock or of the market as a whole react just at the time in which the event realizes or whether they react also afterwards. If they just react at the moment in which the information becomes public, that would be consistent with the efficient market hypothesis. If they instead keep moving afterwards, that would not be consistent with the efficient market hypothesis. And one such event was uh, in mergers and acquisition, see how the returns of the target of a merger move around the time in which the merger is actually announced. And this is one plot in which uh, what you see is the cumulative return uh, that you make by investing in this target firm for the merger. Uh, around the merger date, this is the date in which information about the merger arises. Now what this graph tells you is that you see the stock price of this company is increasing. The returns you're making by holding a stock is increasing smoothly towards the day the merger is announced. So there is gradual information arrival, there are rumors about the possibility of the merger, and so you see that the market starts anticipating with some probability the merger. Uh, then the return peaks after the, when the merger is announced, but you see that the return is flat. It's not that the market, once the merger is announced, still has some potential to exploit. Everything is exploited by that day, and since then onwards, the return is flat. Because the price of the stock has already discounted the profitability of the merger. That's another piece of evidence that people took it as uh, being uh, very favorable to the efficient market hypothesis. So, this is a literature that uh, was burgeoning in uh, the 70s and early 80s. In 78, uh, a leading uh, contributor to this work, Michael Jensen, said that the efficient market hypothesis is the best established fact in all of social sciences. Just because pieces of evidence, such as those that I showed you, were collected, documented systematically, that showed that markets efficiently react and react instantaneously to public information and that returns are unpredictable, uh, that future returns are unpredictable based on past. Uh, 
Now, the world could have ended here, but it didn't. Uh, because uh, people, uh, when they started to investigate uh, the properties, the informational properties of markets, started to find, uh, beginning in the 80s, uh, important departures from the benchmark of efficient markets. One leading departure was documented in a famous paper by De Bon and Taylor, and is evidence of overreaction. Uh, what is overreaction, uh, intuitively speaking? Well, it's the idea that uh, if you see some stocks doing well for a certain period of time, perhaps because people are optimistic about the sector or the firm, they may be going too far. People get excited and the price settles higher than it should be based on the true fundamental. So expectations about the firm are not optimal in the sense that they are too optimistic in light of the data. And same thing about situation in which you see stocks tanking. Yes, maybe there are some bad news for these firms that should legitimately induce investors to sell them and to reduce their valuation for them. But maybe we just get too pessimistic as bad the news accumulate and we overreact in that sense so that we will undervalue those firms relative to what they should be valued according to an objective and optimal use of the information we have acquired huh? or observed. So that's the phenomenon of overreaction and this is uh, precisely how they documented it. So they took stocks and they separated stocks into extreme winners and extreme losers. Among those that in the last three years had extremely high returns and those that over the course of the last three years made extremely bad returns. Okay, the superstars and the underdogs. Then they said, suppose that today I form two portfolios. In one portfolio, I invest into the superstars. In another portfolio, I invest in the underdogs. What happens if I follow these portfolios from now onwards? This is what they have, what happens. Uh, and this is what they documented. If you take losers, so vertically we represent returns, horizontally it's months after portfolio formations, after they have formed the portfolio of superstars and underdogs. What do the underdogs do? They outperform the superstars. So stocks that did consistently worse for the past three years will do consistently better in the future than stocks who did extremely well for the past three years. So the value, they would reduce their valuation for it today, immediately. Or if they knew that the stock doing poorly was undervalued, they would increase their valuation for it immediately. So that the price at the time of portfolio formation would be right so that going forward these two stocks would deliver the same return on average. But they don't. Second fact, uh, and this is for the second version of market efficiency, <coughs> stock returns cannot be predicted from any public information. Okay? Uh, here, uh, Here's another famous uh, fact that, that has been documented, which is, it is not true that we cannot find public information that predicts stock returns. There is a very simple and straightforwardly available piece of public information that can be used to predict return. And that piece of public information 
is the book market value of an asset, the book to market value of an asset. This is uh, the ratio between the value of assets of a firm as they are written on the firm's book to the stock market value of the firm. Now, it's clear that these two things can be different, right? The book value and the market value. Why could they be different? You know, maybe we expect some firms just to grow in the future. So, for these firms, their market price will discount, will be large because it reflects future growth even though the current assets, you know, are not so large. And accordingly, some other firms might have many, many assets, but have fewer growth opportunities. <coughs> and so, for these firms, the market valuation will not much larger, uh, say, than the assets in place. Uh, so, to give an idea, uh, an, um, an asset with a low book to market uh, value with a very large stock market value relative to the current assets would be Microsoft or you know, an IT firms when IT firms were initially listed in the markets. Uh, it was a, an exciting sector, they had the future business prospects but they were not making a lot of business at the time. But you could see why they might be valued a lot while having little asset curve. Now, this violation of market efficiency arises because if you sort stocks, if you divide stocks into those that have many assets relative to market valuation and those that have a few assets relative to market valuation, you can use this to predict the future returns of these stocks. So here, you show the return Again, what you do here, you form portfolio. Portfolio of firms that have many assets relative to market value. Portfolios of firms that have few assets relative to market value. So here, you would have, say, a traditional industry. Here, you would have Microsoft of firms in the high-tech sector. If once you form this portfolio, you evaluate the returns going forward, you see that the highest returns are in assets with low book to market. With high book to market, sorry. And low returns are in assets with low book to market. It seems that the market has overvalued the growth opportunities of some firms. It seems that if there are sectors, for instance, that are expected to grow, people will boost market valuations above the current assets, but they will do it too much, too much. Perhaps because they will get excited about these new sectors. And so what you would expect going forward is that these prices that are inflated get corrected slowly through towards the fundamental. Now there has been behind this uh, uh, puzzle, if you want, there has been some discussion of reasons why uh, firms with uh, a high book to market should perform better than firms with low book to market. And uh, actually, this is a fact that was uh, robustly documented by uh, Eugene Fama, who was the proponent, or one of the main proponents of the efficient market hypothesis. And his explanation was, well, value stocks, namely stocks with high book to market, have higher risk. So the fact that they deliver higher returns uh, is reflecting the fact that these stocks face higher risk of bankruptcy. So the higher return is not a market inefficiency, it's compensating investors for uh, the higher risk that they're taking. Uh, this explanation does not sit comfortably with the data because if you look at the data, 
it actually appears that their stock, these stocks are not more exposed to bankruptcy risk than, uh, than, the, than the growth stock. Uh, the psychological explanation instead is again the idea that investors get excited about growing markets, growing firms, and so they overvalue them, whereas they get less excited about more stable market, more boring stocks, and so they tend to undervalue them. So, uh, many of many facts like this have then been documented, and the field of behavioral finance has essentially uh, largely progressed by documenting anomaly over anomalies on many, many different domains. So not just uh, in terms of stocks sorted with respect to book to market, not just in terms of winners and losers in the past, but also in terms of firms attempting to time the market in order to issue equity, uh, and many, many other, uh, many, many other uh, uh, phenomena, such as reaction of stock prices to earning announcement, and so on and so forth. Now, how do you kind of justify uh, this anomaly and the fact that prices might depart for extended periods of time from what uh, the efficient market hypothesis would predict? Remember that there are two pillars of efficient market. One is the fact that expectations are correct of at least some investors. Another is that as soon as there is a mispricing, this gets corrected by arbitrageurs. The foundations of conceptual foundation of behavioral economics concern, in the first place, the idea that we are systematically biased in the way we perceive reality and process information. But the second pillar is, even if there are people who can perfectly assess information, there are limits to arbitrage. Because the activity of arbitrage is not costless, but it's in fact costly. And it's subject to significant risk. Well, I want to go through, uh, to conclude, um, the discussion of these two ingredients. The first is systematic bias. What you really need is that people exhibit common tendency to make mistakes. If we just come up with random valuations of stocks uh, or random departures from the correct valuation, all of these departures, all of the mistakes we individually make would average out in the aggregate. And so they wouldn't affect the stock market as a whole. For uh, departures from rationality to affect stock prices, it has to be that they are systematic. That people suffer from common uh, information processing problems. And this is in fact precisely what psychology tells us. And I will talk a bit about uh, that. Um, and the second, as I said, is uh, that there are uh, limits to arbitrage, and I will also give some uh, further detail on this. So, what are the systematic biases? Uh, what are the type of uh, problems we might have, or what might be the way in which we depart from uh, perfect information uh, processing uh, machines? Well, in psychology, there are two biases that uh, have people have held uh, responsible for many problems in uh, probability judgments. And when I talk about problems, I talk deviations from statistical theories that are good normative guidance for the way we should treat data. And these psychological forces are, one, representativeness bias, which was uh, documented in lab studies by two psychologists, uh, Kahneman and Tversky. One of the two Kahneman won the Nobel Prize 
in economics. Uh, and the second uh, bias is called conservatism bias. What are they? Well, representativeness. The idea of representativeness is that when we get some salient information, some information that attracts our attention, we tend to react too much to it. Uh, to give an example, imagine that you see a yellow object shining in the sidewalk. Then you kind of jump because you think it's gold. Uh, or it's a coin, it's a valuable object. The issue is, is it legitimate to think that it's gold or a valuable object? Well, not really, because if you think about the base probability of finding valuable objects in the side, sidewalk, the baseline probability is very low. So the fact that I'm receiving a signal doesn't imply that I should react fast. Why do we react fast? Because seeing a shining object is representative of a valuable object. To give an example in the context of finance, uh, imagine that you see a firm that is making, in the short term, good performance, so it's investing in a, profit, in a, pro, in a promising technology, say, in the IT sector. What is the probability that you should attach, if you are rational, to that firm becoming the next Google? Well, the probability must be very, very low because firms like Google, we know, even without any information, are extremely rare. Representativeness tells us that is the force whereby when we see a salient good performance that reminds us of Google, we overreact. And we tend to jump too quickly to the conclusion that this is an extremely pro promising firm and that will be likely to perform like Google in the future. What is conservatism bias instead is the idea that when we receive information that is not startling, that is not surprising, that is not salient, we will tend to underreact to it. Sometimes, for instance, information is just conveyed by the fact that something does not happen. Think about the possibility of a merger deal uh, occurring. Well, if I don't receive information about the merger deal and developments, well, I should revise downward my probability that the merger deal is going to be concluded, because if there is something, uh, I should get some signals. Okay? If something is burning, I should see the smoke. But in fact, uh, it might be hard for us to react to the event of not receiving information because that does not attract our attention. And so in these cases you will tend to underreact. There is information available, but you will not take it into account because it's not salient, it's not surprising, it does not draw your attention. Uh, there are other biases that people have discussed, you know, overconfidence, biases in believing that, you know, we are extremely good at making investment decisions or at picking firms in light of private information. We have or biases of self-confirming nature. I consider information that confirms my views, but I discard information that goes against my views. Uh, and all of these are going to give you, in one way or another, patterns of overreaction and underreaction to uh, information. Then, why this does not get corrected? Why arbitrage is limited? Why, even if there are people who are uh, smart and capable, they do not exploit the profit opportunities created by psychological biases? Uh, here, roughly speaking, two ideas have been put forward. One is that arbitrage is costly. Uh, 
Uh, one of the costs of arbitrage is that arbitrage is risky. You know that uh, securities might be overpriced today, but you don't know exactly when they will revert to fundamentals. So if you take a position uh, in terms of betting against uh, these securities, then you might lose big time if in the short run their overvaluation becomes even more severe. That risk makes arbitrage costly because we are not patient enough or we don't have a long enough horizon to bear comfortably the risk that in the short run the mispricing might increase rather than decrease. Uh, the second form of uh, limited arbitrage or reason why arbitrage might not work very well is uh, the idea that in the end uh, arbitrageurs uh, don't remove this mispricing by investing their own capital because they don't have enough capital to remove all mispricing. They need to borrow capital from other investors. Uh, but then if they borrow capital from other investors, they also need to earn the trust of other investors. So these other investors must believe, like the arbitrageur themselves, that there is mispricing. Uh, but then you see how this creates a problem. Uh, how can it be that you are in a world where many people are subject to this misperception, uh, but they nevertheless, but they judge their perceptions to be correct. And they delegate to an arbitrageur who invests against their same perception. Uh, they might lose confidence on the arbitrageur, particularly again if the market does not correct swiftly, and this will create yet another problem uh, for the process of arbitrage to bring the prices back to fundamentals. So this is an assessment of the basic evidence underlying behavioral finance, the basic psychological forces uh, that are provided as explanations of these departures from market efficiency. What needs to be done is to create a consistent, coherent model of these biases that can be systematically uh, confronted with the data, just like standard uh, rational expectations, asset pricing model are tested uh, systematically with the data. Thank you. Another very special uh, guest who, just like uh, Professor Ginaioli was before, is also a member of the faculty at the Cone University in the finance department. We move on to the more practical and applied side of our data. Professor Bertardi, who is our second guest speaker, he obtained his uh, PhD in economics from Yale University, where he worked closely together with Professor Robert Schiller, who recently won uh, also a Nobel Prize. Now, uh, to the professional excellence of Professor Andrea Bertardi, uh, we certainly have to mention his role as the chairman of Intesa San Paolo, which uh, many of you know is one of the largest banks in Italy. Currently, he's the chairman of Horizon uh, Capital, which is uh, an asset management company. Then there are all sorts of initiatives that uh, Professor Petati was in. Uh, he's very dedicated to financial education. Uh, I guess I will just uh, pass my word now to uh, Professor Bertatti and I uh, hope you enjoy. So, thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm very glad to be here. Just a couple of words uh, on my current non-academic uh, work uh, in order to sort of uh, set up the framework for a couple of things I'm going to say later on about the practical applications of asset management. Uh, Eurizon Capital is the name of the company. It is actually uh, a very large uh, asset manager. We manage uh, 250 billion euros in assets. Uh, we are uh, 
focused on, on Italy, traditionally, even though we've been expanding uh, and we are trying to expand internationally. So maybe importantly, we own 49% of the seventh largest Chinese asset manager based in Shenzhen. Uh, we also have uh, a little uh, asset management hub for Eastern Europe. Uh, and uh, we try to interact with the uh, international clients as much as possible. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about the state of the market rather than the company itself, let me just give you a number which is, I think, very indicative of what is going on, not only for us, but for the asset management industry as a whole. In the Four months this year, say January 1st until the end of April, our assets under management went up by approximately 30 million in four months. So it is an incredible rate of growth. It is certainly one of the best in the industry. We are also one of the most efficient asset managers around the world. Our cost of production is very, very low compared to most asset managers around the world. So we are definitely a very efficient person. Uh, the whole industry is actually benefiting from uh, the current market conditions, uh, uh, not only in Europe, but uh, everywhere, uh, everywhere else around the world, even though Italy certainly is one of the places to be right now because uh, traditionally Italians uh, always had very precautionary portfolios. So you look historically at what Italian investors have been doing uh, and uh, they decided to give a lot of money in fixed income, bank deposits, just a little bit in equity. And of course, uh, with the current market conditions, basically zero interest rates, uh, a lot of customers uh, are uh, deciding to switch, uh, to take a little bit more of risk, and therefore, as a result, given that Italy is a relatively open market in terms uh, of asset management, uh, we have uh, several international firms uh, coming to Italy and increasing operations in Italy because uh, they want to benefit from this uh, incredible shift from uh, a very precautionary portfolio a more uh, interesting portfolio that creates uh, more value both for the customers and of course uh, for the asset management company. So let me uh, get directly to the application of behavioral finance and what I think uh, is uh, useful in practical terms. First, let me take the view of a large asset manager and not uh, of a retail investor managing wealth for fun or for herself or itself. So let me take the, the view of a large asset manager. And uh, from the point of view of a large asset manager, clearly, you need to have in place a structural process by which you are able to produce uh, asset management with uh, a minimum of risks for the clients. You need to control risk. And uh, you need to be very structural in your approach. So it is important to notice immediately that uh, if you professionally work in the asset management industry, it is very unlikely that uh, you are going to do a lot of trading every day. You are going to have a very short life. Of course, uh, there are people, there are products, and there are companies, maybe smaller companies, they try to be very active and really produce extra return with a lot of fancy techniques. But that is not uh, the largest part uh, of the asset management industry. Okay, so many people have the idea that if you're an asset manager, you're really trying to make a lot of money in the short run, and you're going to use whatever you can use in order to beat the market. Certainly, you want to beat the market because of the several reasons. And, uh, I uh, speak more about those reasons later on. But uh, you need to be systematic. And you need to have a structural approach. You need to justify what you're doing. You need to explain 
you needed to explain to your compliance department, you needed to explain to the risk department, you needed to explain to the clients. And so if you start using some fancy techniques that you are unable to explain, that is going to be a very difficult position. So first message, which I think is very important, when you think of the asset management industry, you have to think of something that is very systematic, where you have risk control, where regulation is very important, and therefore you cannot simply decide to wake up and sell or buy some industry. So it is, I think, an important message, which is crucial for you if you consider asset management potentially as a career after you finish study. So that is something important. And so why is behavioral finance so useful from this more structural point of view? Well, the reason why it is useful, I think, it is because it provides both positive suggestions of examples that you might want to follow in order to actually do a good service for, for your clients, but also negative examples of what you should avoid if you want to be a successful professional. And let me start uh, with the negative examples uh, that uh, have not been mentioned really by Nicola, because they belong to a different part uh, of the empirical uh, academic literature. Uh, Nicola has mentioned a lot of studies about uh, taking uh, data from uh, uh, the markets, prices and returns, and compute uh, the rate of return of strategies. That is clearly very useful, and it is perhaps uh, the positive thing that we can learn from behavioral finance. But there are also a lot of studies actually looking at the performance of individual investors. Okay. Those studies are very relevant because uh, they've been able to show that uh, especially retail investors make huge mistakes in managing their wealth. Okay. And uh, a few of the things that have been shown uh, are, for example, that people, retail investors, do too much trading, buying and selling securities too frequently. So, if you rank retail investors on the basis of the frequency of their trading, you see that the net rate of return on their portfolios goes down with the increase in the frequency of trading. So, the more you trade, the less money you make. And the difference is very important. So, in the samples that people have been looking about, uh, basically, there is a 5% opportunity cost to being an heavy trader rather than trading very infrequently in the market. So, we are talking about people making uh, huge mistakes because uh, if you give up 5% on average every year of the potential rate of return that is provided by the market, then clearly you are making a very big mistake. So, is that useful for a, for a professional asset manager? Certainly, from two points of view. One, negative, as I told you, you are a professional trader, you don't want to repeat the same mistake, because clearly, probably, you have more information, you are probably smarter than the average retail investor trading in the market. But still, you know that, also drawing on psychological studies, you may have a tendency to feel that you are much smarter than everybody else in the market, and therefore you may have an inclination to buy and sell too frequently. So, knowing that there is an important evidence of overreacting in the market is useful for a professional because you want to avoid making the same mistake. But, second, I think, and this is a positive example of how an asset manager may actually use the empirical evidence. If you realize that people do too much trading in their portfolios, you may want to use the available evidence in order to help your clients. Because remember, to an asset manager, especially to somebody providing mutual funds and products to investors, so much trading from the point of view of the retail investor is very damaging. 
because of course as an asset manager if your client gets in and goes out clearly you have to rebalance your portfolio more and more frequently and at the end of the day the rate of return that you're going to provide to all clients would be much lower than what would happen otherwise if people were more relaxed and had a longer horizon so you may want to find the ways in some sense to prevent people from doing things that are stupid, okay? You could decide to try and build that in the new products. We've seen a generation of new products in asset management in the last five, six years. Whereas until 10 years ago, a lot of the final decision was left to the customer. So you could basically imagine a product that was an equity product, and then you had a fixed income product, and then you had a uh, gold product and so on, which would leave uh, all the responsibility for dynamic asset allocation to people with the potential of making huge mistakes if they overreact to the information set. You can try and build products that mix an equity uh, position with fixed income, with gold and so on, and maybe they are able to dynamically manage this exposure through systematic ideas. Okay, which certainly reduce the turnover ratio and at the end of the day also benefit the final consumer. So this is an example where the final consumer delegates the responsibility for the tactical asset allocation to the asset manager who produces a more general product that deals with several asset classes and at the end of the day it is very beneficial both for the asset manager and for the client. Uh, as far as I know, several companies uh, have been studying uh, the rate of return of their clients through the mutual funds and uh, the rate of return that the clients would have got if they had had a longer horizon and uh, had done less trading. And I think everybody knows that uh, the second option is much better for the final consumer and for the asset manager. So this is an example of things that we learn from behavior finance and that can be used for improving the performance. Uh, there are uh, other evidence, uh, there is other evidence that is also important. For example, there are nice pieces uh, of research that try to understand why people buy stocks and notice the evidence that we have is that uh, a lot of people have a very undiversified portfolio. So rather than holding a mutual fund or an index, they hold maybe three stocks in their equity portfolio. And clearly, as you know, if you judge a portfolio of three stocks and compare it to the efficiency frontier, clearly your opportunity cost is very, very large. Okay. The stocks that they pick in their portfolios. And it has been shown, I think, that the people are very much affected by the media and the headlines that they see in newspaper and nowadays uh, presumably from news that they see in, uh, in Google and other internet based uh, tools of communication uh, and so if you wanted to describe informally what happens is that very often people read news about uh, stock okay the, stock, the, the news could be positive or negative you always find somebody who is attracted by that stock Okay, if the news is positive and the stock has been going up, you could say, aha, uh -huh. you know, the stock will, will keep going up in the future, I won't buy it. If uh, the stock has been going down and the news is bad, you could say, okay, I'm a contrarian investor and therefore I want to buy it anyway. And of course, uh, as uh, more people react to news, you have that more volatility is associated with the news. And in the end, you have a sort of vicious circle by which you have some information, you have people buying and selling unnecessarily maybe, and you have more volatility in the market. So that is another example of how you can try to get information from the literature and try to reduce your impact. If you are an asset manager, of course, you are not simply looking at the headline, but you are trying to use the more positive piece of evidence from the literature that I was talking about and Nicola has been talking about, which is systematic strategies. 
Nicola has been talking about the value strategy, long, high book, high book to market stocks, and the short, low book to market stocks, but there are many other strategies, and each strategy is relevant and potentially important. Maybe it's going to work for three quarters, for a couple of years, maybe it's not going to work for 10 years, because maybe the market is dynamic and it is changing, but at least having a, stra a strategy in your mind is helpful because you have the discipline. So rather than just buying and selling, depending on the news, depending on what happens to the interest rate and so on, you really try to be systematic and to have discipline. And that is, I think, a big advantage from the point of view of professional asset managers who also understand the so, uh, at the end of the day, I think behavioral finance is uh, very useful in practice. Uh, we are, as Nicola was saying in Italy, we are so far from physics. I mean, in physics, we started well an anomaly maybe 100 years ago. And after a few decades of anomaly, we came up with a new theory. And basically, you look at the theory, and uh, you come up with an accelerator, and you spend a billion of dollars in order to do a scientific experiment, if you actually find what the theory has been predicting for 30 years, okay, which is fantastic, it is exactly what you would expect from a science. In finance, it has been a little bit the other way around. Okay? We have a big theory, which is very theoretical, plenty of anomalies, but as Nicola himself was saying at the beginning of the talk, we don't have a real alternative that is able to predict something that uh, we haven't observed in yet. And uh, you may remember that uh, a few of the discussions after the 2008 credit crisis was that uh, uh, nobody was able to predict the crisis. Okay? So if we had a good theory of the way the economy and the financial markets work, perhaps uh, we could have had uh, some more uh, initial guesses uh, at the potential causes of the crisis. So uh, I think uh, we need to put behavioral finance uh, in the right place. I think it is very interesting. It is full of practical suggestions. I think there is a lot of interest among asset managers to actually better understand the trading strategies that are proposed by academic papers and that many of them try actually to follow some of those strategies. That is the positive part. The negative part is trying to avoid making the same mistakes that especially retail investors do because you want to overperform. And of course, as an asset manager, and, and, and let me conclude, and then here, if you have questions about the industry, uh, a very important part is also realize that very often you are not managing a portfolio in general. You are managing a portfolio against a well-identified benchmark. So to you as an asset manager, it is impossible to ignore what is the performance of the benchmark. Okay? So would professional equity managers in 2009 understand that the market would crash and still keep a relevant portion of their equity funds in stocks? Yes, because they would be wrong. If they were wrong, the benchmark would skyrocket maybe 30%, and you would be one of the few managers in the market with maybe minus 5% or plus 5, okay? because you are not following the time. So, you also have to keep in mind that being a professional asset manager is not only about being smart, having creativity, looking at research, devising strategies, but you have also a lot of duties that are basically try to stick with the benchmark and get partially because you are going to be judged against the benchmark. You need to comply with risk requirements that are set within the company because within the company of course you have a hierarchy of decisions because formally in many companies it is actually the board together with the CEO who is in charge with the tactical asset allocation that you do every month. So clearly if the view at the board level is positive on stocks 
uh, you cannot simply allow your own traders to go very long stocks because they believe the stock market is going up. You need to put constraints and therefore the manager may be right, the board may be wrong, but you need some sort of formal relationship within the company and so you want to have some specific guidelines by which if you are a positive uh, trader in a company with a negative view of the equity market, you can uh, be above the benchmark by say 5-10%. You cannot let a single manager to go up 20-25% uh, uh, in terms of equity exposure. So once you take all of that into account, you really understand that the role of a manager in a large company is a little bit different from what you may have in mind of a genius with plenty of intuition making one million at the end of the year and just timing the market or picking the right stocks. Okay? And so once you take into account the actual working of the industry, you understand that there are many considerations that you have to take into account in actually managing your clients. So, uh, come to an end. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you. That's it for uh, thank you. for the valuable time and uh, coming here and sharing your experience with us. I'd also like to thank the entire uh, Bocconi Economic Student Association which is uh, present all over the room for organizing this event. And of course all the guests for taking your time even though it's, it was a very hot day. I hope you enjoyed the session and uh, you could take something valuable with you.